just just poke you more into the Greyhound stuff. How do you find um, your data sources there? Is there enough information out there? Um, is it all automated, your betting activity? Talk us through that. Yeah, so the Greyhound stuff um, started building on purely public data, um, found that there, there was an edge, an edge there um, where the markets were underpricing certain variables. Um, and, you know, I had never watched a Greyhound race before this. I probably don't really have any interest in watching Greyhound races. It's more a, it's more a problem to solve and, um, you know, a way to make money. And then just talk about some, some publicly available data that you've used on any of your sports. Is, is Fitzroy your AFL one that you go to? Or is it a few places that what I'm trying to do is, is pry um, anyone that's kind of listening to this that's curious and wants to have a play with some public data, where do you recommend they go? Yes, AFL um, is pretty good with data. It's, it's one of those sports that lends itself um, pretty well to data modelling. Um, so I don't use Fitzroy, but I use the same source that Fitzroy scrapes from. Um, so Fitzroy is a great resource. Um, uh, I started up my data scrape before um, Fitzroy was created, so I just use, this, use that, but um, it's all pretty much the same data source. So, you know, AFL tables. Um, I think I think now, actually, a lot of the stuff is straight off the AFL website, so it, it makes it very easy now. You can get pretty much all the stats on the AFL website, um, which makes it easy to scrape before scraping for a few sources. And um, I'm still doing that now just because of the infrastructure is already there. But I think scraping, um, strip scraping this year with the new um, AFL site, uh, I know it's got um, some of its other issues, but for stats, it's, I think it's, it's pretty good. Okay. And is NRL just as good or are they typically a little bit behind? Uh, NRL, it's fully all from the site. Um, there used to be a site, I think, similar to AFL tables. It might have been NRL tables, but stopped being updated, um, I think, a couple of years back. But all my NRL stuff just comes from uh, comes from the site. Um, but having said that, the NRL model is probably a um, less variables than the AFL models. So probably not using um, I'm probably not using the extent of the data that's out there. Um, so there's probably better better data sources to use. Okay, cool. And um, just in terms of your staking strategy, I'm really curious in terms of how you identify, you know, I've got this much of an edge on the market. I, I feel like this is about, are you just consistently having, if something meets a certain criteria, having a certain amount or you're doing some Kelly stuff or what are you doing? Yeah, so it's a version of Kelly. I mean, it's probably close, closest to something like half Kelly um, on sports. Um, so AFL and NRL, the bigger the edge, the bigger the overlay, um, the more I'll stake. Uh, for Greyhounds, it's probably a bit different. Um, so I think I think in a perfect world, um, you want to stake more when your edge is higher. Um, that makes sense. The the caveat there is is that on certain sports, and I think Greyhounds, Darrow Bridge is, is probably um, a good example, is that sometimes the higher your edge on the model, the lower your ROI, just because it could be the case that you might identify a you know a two hundred percent edge. But that's just because that the dog that you've um, that you put in the model, one of the other dogs, has had a trial that no one knows about, or you know they do know about, but it's just not in your model. So that 200% edge is actually you know it, it's not actually right. So if you start staking up full Kelly on that, you're gonna be uh, you're gonna be poor pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Greyhounds, I don't actually use Kelly um, right now. We're kind of staking to staking to win a certain amount. Um, with a bit of Kelly in there, but um, I, I am very wary with Greyhounds on the very big edges because most of the time they're wrong. Right. Okay. That's that's interesting. And is this all back betting or are you doing some lay stuff, 50-50? Uh, all my automated stuff is back stuff. If, I'm, um, if I decide to be a bit of a degenerate that day and watch some races, I might lay a bit. Um, but my bot stuff, which is you know ninety five percent of my um, my staking on Betfair, is all back. Yeah. Okay, good to know. And then just in terms of updating the dog model, how, how do you know that that needs a needs a light touch and needs you know some new variables or it, it's over indexing on some things? How do you work out when it needs a, a little service? Yeah, I'm kind of always um, I'm always looking at um, improving the dog model. Like I've only been modeling it for maybe three months. So 
I, I, you know, it's nowhere near perfect. It is making a, a pretty decent uh, return at the moment, but I know there's there's plenty of things that can um, can be improved on that. Um, so I'm always working on it. So it's probably the, the major project I'm working on now, and I'm not really working on anything else in terms of fundamental models, just because I want to get too sidetracked. So yeah, I'm, I'm always adding new things to the dog model, um, trying to keep pretty clean version control because it gets you get pretty out of hand when you're testing new things that don't work out. You've got to, you've got to um, do proper project control where you don't really know where everything is at, at, at a certain stage, stage, stage in time, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious to just uh, transitioning to, to more the day-to-day side of punting. You've, you've gone from, I, I assume, a, a very good student who's probably got some great grades at uni, gone through the banking system, and you're probably progressing up this chain. How did the conversation go with your family, friends, girlfriend? Hey, I'm I'm giving it away. I'm going to be a punter. That, that's yeah, that's um, not not good. Well, let, let me let me let me start with that. So, um, you know, working in banking for so long, and I'm a, I'm typically a pretty risk averse guy. So, um, making that transition first in terms of my own mental um, mindset was was pretty hard. Like getting getting past the stage where like I'm um, saying that I can do this and not not require a you know a fortnight check you know, that, that was pretty hard to get out of get out of in the first place and having a conversation with my uh, my parents you know they they're very typical Asian, Asian parents you know work for a company for forty years uh, you know get your get your super and then live a happy life yeah so they they thought I was a bit insane. Um, and, and even like talking to workmates when I left. So I actually, um, before I started doing this, I just started a, a new job. Um, so I stayed in that job. So I had been for probably about two years that I wanted to try doing full-time punting, but just um, couldn't get out of that safety net of a, of a full-time, sorry, a, a steady check. Um, so yeah. I started a new job thinking that would, um, you know, re- reinvigorate me. Started that job for a week, realized, don't want to do this and I handed in my resignation uh, on the Friday and I started on the Monday and I'm like okay this is the kick I need to just uh I know I don't want to do a nine to five job for the rest of my life let me just give this a try if it doesn't work I can always go back but um you know luckily I had had but you know the conversations weren't easy everyone thought I was insane um they probably still, still <laughs> and then how, yeah it's st- still I imagine you know saying that it as a full-time income, and I've, I've had that as, as mine for certain periods of my life, not to the success of yours and the length of yours, but how do you go just in social circles now in terms of saying, hey, I, I bet professionally on Greyhounds, what sort of response do you get? Uh, I don't. So I, I guess I don't. I kind, of, I kind of do a bit of a white lie when people ask, what do you do? I'm like, oh, you know, I work in data analytics. I do a bit of a sports, <laughs> sports analytics here and there. And I just hope that they don't have a follow-up question. <laughs> um, but I think I found pretty, pretty early on that there's just no benefit in saying that you're a full-time gambler because people have their, um, I guess people have their views of what that means. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, 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 just, I just think there's no benefit for my own, uh, you know, I guess my own, uh, my own mental well-being in trying to explain yeah. that and trying to prove to them that it's something that can, uh, can be done. And there's no benefit on their part either. So I just try to like brush it off. Like, yeah, I do a bit of consulting, data analytics. You know, what do you do? Tell me more about what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Flip, flip the table. I like that. Um, just in terms of, like I, I often ask, I've, I've been fortunate enough to do a few of these now and I'm really curious that the the loneliness that can come with pro punting and, and the the the, cha- the mental challenges of some really bad variants. How do you deal with that in terms of getting your, your personal connection and, and keeping your head on straight and, and feeling good? Yeah, the, I mean, the first one was always hard, and Betfair's been a really good, um, a really good um, solution to that. Um, you know, before when I was doing this um, full time, um, prior to betting so much on Betfair, um, yeah, I was definitely very lonely. I was doing it by myself. Um, a lot of time you wouldn't get much interaction, just because on on weekends it's probably your biggest days, and everyone else is um, uh, is out and about, and your you know, my my days off were generally Monday or Tuesday and everyone was at work. Um, so they got really, you know, really lonely, I would admit. I would admit. Um, 
Then when I got started betting more into Betfair, I got in contact with a lot of Betfair people that are in the same thing. Kind of opened, you know, opened my eyes a bit to into like how many people are actually doing this, sending it professionally and professionally. Um, yeah. Just maintaining those networks, especially um, with those people that are a bit more quantitatively um, minded. Um, so I know now that, um, especially with the Karen on board, um, there's a lot more um, data, data analytics um, events and meetups, um, and the Slack channel that's um, that's uh, that Betfair is set up is pretty good as well. So um, still not perfect, you know, still not um, what you get uh, from working a, a corporate job with a big team, but um, you know, it's, it's a lot better. Um, the social aspect's a lot better than it was when I first. And started. you work. Um... Yeah. You got a, a communal office or a like co-working space as well, so not just at home all the time. Yeah, I go to a co-working space literally five minutes down the road, so probably it doesn't make too much sense because um, you know, like the so close, what why bother? But I think having um having that social interaction, um, even if you're not really talking to anyone, just having people working around you, I think it really yeah. does really does help and motivate you rather than just um, sitting at home, the bed's so close by, you know, maybe taking a nap here and there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then just with the mental side of it, like how do you, um, is there anything that you do in terms of, you know, what you eat, what you practice in terms of just, you know, keeping a fresh head for, for punting each day? Yeah, I think, um, I think what helps is, uh, since a lot of my stuff is automated, it kind of takes the um, it kind of takes some of the demons away when you get when you're being right there. So I'm not watching anything, and I know when I when I did bet manually, if you watch something and then something gets beat and it's a bad beat, you know we're all human. It's it's hard not to take that a bit. You know you think the world's against you, um, despite all the logic. You're like kind of thinking, oh shit, do I double uh, double down on the next one? Um, having it automated makes it a lot easier because I'm not betting, I'm not watching. All I'm doing is um, monitoring the results at the end of every day, at the end of every week. And I can make a much more logical decision on are things working, do things need to change. Is my staking wrong, for example? Um, it just makes it a bit more robotic, which is what I want, you know, what I what I like to do with betting rather than having any emotion in there. Um, but at, at that beginning, it was definitely very hard, especially... Um, Especially if this is um, this was my full time income, and you're just trying to make a uh, make a certain amount of money. Um, if you have a bad week and that um, if you're not making that money, it's hard not to it's hard not to have that affect you. Like we're we're human, yeah. it's going to affect you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, just in terms of uh, conscious of your time, I want to wrap up. Is there any sports you've got your eye on at the moment that you sort of see as an opportunity to to you know, do some homework on and potentially have a crack at? Yeah, I think after Greyhounds, probably um, I, I did at the beginning, did my, um, did my feet a bit into, into racing, uh, thoroughbreds specifically. Um, might give that another crack. Um, some of the US sports, um, I know NBA is, is pretty efficient, but I think there are certain angles that you can take um, that, that still have a, um, a bit of opportunity there. Um, but I think Greyhounds will probably still take up most of my time for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think, um, yeah, racing, racing is one of those things that's, that's, um, that's kind of like the, if you can get that right, it's kind of like the golden egg because there's so much liquidity, so many races. Um, you don't need to have that big an edge. And even if there's um, big syndicates like the doctor and see out there doing it, there's enough that um, a small player can still get in. It's got the liquidity and the, the breadth of markets out there. But that, that will probably be my next thing. And you think you'll practice the, the fundamental stuff in terms of using, um, you know, racing sectional data or you think you uh, do more of the, the market stuff? Yeah, probably more of the fundamental stuff. I already have a market-based bot working on horse racing, which is it's pretty much one of those things that, that, that gets in and out. So it's kind of scalping a couple of ticks here and there. Um, so fundamental stuff, and I think that's where it's more of an interest to me, um, trying to get like a fair price for every, every run and seeing how that goes. Um, but, yeah, I know horse racing will be um, a lot tougher than greyhound racing, but um, it will be a pretty nice challenge when it gets to that stage. 
Nice. All right, Matt. I'll uh, I'll leave you there. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for joining me from Sydney. And uh, we've got your story on the hub. Um, anyone that's got any comments, I encourage them to put them on this YouTube video, um, and we'll feed them back to Jason see if we can harass him for a response. So thank you, mate. Appreciate it.